Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining this second session of ISEP's uh, conference, virtual conference on applying theory to practice. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, have you with us and thank you for giving your time to join us. We had a tremendous uh, uh, engagement with us yesterday in our, good evening. In our uh, first session. Thank you so much for joining and this I hope that um, conference, virtual conference. I hope uh, many of you were able to join us yesterday uh, to hear the overview of our uh, conference theme of applying uh, theory to practice in our work in drug demand reduction. Um, today we've got a, a, a very uh, interesting session to look at that specific aspect of, of treatment uh, and how we can understand the evidence-based theory and principles and learning that we need to apply if possible uh, and then we'll be hearing some work on the case studies of how that happens in practice before we uh, begin the session just let me mention a couple of items of housekeeping one please be assured that there will be a certificate of attendance uh, emailed to you after the event so you should receive a, a, a certificate of your attendance in, in joining this session um, the session will be recorded uh, and will be subsequently available on ISOP's website. Um, so those that miss it or are not able to join us, we hope you'll pass on that message to them. We hope you will engage with us. It's the start of a process and a dialogue with you. So any questions you have, please uh, type them in the questions chat section. Um, they'll be gathered and, and answered as far as possible in the Q&A session at the end of our session today. Uh, and we would like to hear all the questions we may not be able to answer all of them, but we can then uh, put them together and, and, and re reflect on them and try and get back to you with any questions uh, we leave unanswered. Uh, and there is interpretation of this uh, uh, session into uh, other languages in Spanish and Arabic uh, and Russian. And if you would like to know the how to do that, can you see the uh, instructions that are in the chat section uh, on your screen in the GoToWebinar? So look to the chat section to follow the instructions to get the interpretation. So I hope you have a, 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 va a valuable, interesting session. Thank you for joining us. I want to hand over to Martin Nguogi, um, who is from ISAP Nigeria, the president of ISAP Nigeria, our national chapters. Um, managed by Olivia Odegger at, at ISAP Global, uh, have played a massive role in supporting uh, this work. And Martin, as uh, the president of ISAP Nigeria, will be moderating the session. So over to you, Martin, uh, and I hope we have a very good session with you all. Thank you very much, Chair, for that uh, uh, introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you once again for joining us. Uh, so I welcome you to the second day of uh, ISOP uh, International uh, Conference. Uh, my name again is uh, Martin uh, Agoje. I'm the founder, executive director of Global Initiative on Substance Abuse, uh, GISO, and uh, the national president of ISOP Nigeria chapter. I will be moderating this uh, session. Uh, in this session, uh, we'll be looking at uh, treatment, evidence-based principles, uh, theory, and uh, provision. Uh, we'll be having uh, three speakers who will be making input to this uh, topic. Uh, the first uh, input is the evidence base for the provision of treatment of substance use uh, disorders. Uh, here, we want to know what is effective in drug disorder treatments, uh, what we can learn from evidence base uh, about what works and uh, what doesn't uh, work. So to lead us in the discussion is uh, Anete Da Pereira. Uh, Anete is Director EDP uh, Consultancy UK. Uh, international consultant to UNODC and Colombo Plan, as well as uh, a visiting academic, Middlesex uh, University, London. 
uh, nature has uh, a nature, you can have your camera on as I introduce you. Thank you, Martin. Okay, thank you, Anita. Anita has over 35 years of experience in the area of substance use disorders. Uh, this included over 30 years in the UK public sector as uh, a counseling psychologist, a research fellow for the University of London, a national policy lead on drug demand reduction, among other positions and uh, responsibilities uh, in the UK. Uh, since 2016, Anita has worked for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, the World Health Organization, uh, the European Monetary Center on Drugs and Drug Addiction, uh, as well as the Global Plan on International Standards and Quality Assurance for Drug Use Disorder Treatment Services and Systems, as well as Treatment Intervention Guidelines and Training. Uh, she has provided technical support training and capacity building for over 14 countries, including my country, Nigeria. This is excellent credential. Thank you, uh, Nete, for the work uh, you do. Uh, just before I invite uh, the speaker to, to take it over from here, uh, please let me rem remind the participants uh, to drop their questions while the presentation is going on uh, using the chat box. So at this time, let me hand over to Anita to take it up from here. Anita, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Martin, for that so lovely much. introduction. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Did that work? Yes. Yep, you've got my screen? Yes, we can see it. Fantastic, that's great. So thank you very much to ISUP um, uh, for letting me speak today. And thank you for that lovely introduction, uh, Martin. It's uh, delightful to be able to do this slot. Um, I've got a quite difficult task, I think, and that's to talk about what is effective in drug use disorder treatment and what we can learn uh, from the evidence base about what works and what doesn't work uh, in a relatively short space of time. So I'm going to try and do this in 30 minutes. So it will be slightly selective. Uh, so uh, let me just flag that up from the beginning. Um, uh, my declarations of interest are there. I think that most of those have been covered already. Now, what I'd like to do today is cover uh, some points about effectiveness and the evidence base and some issues that I think that we need to consider as practitioners or managers or researchers. I'd like to give you some of the headlines on, on some of the key interventions for drug use disorder treatment in terms of effectiveness and then uh, finish up with some key take home points about individualized treatment and patient journeys. Okay, so what does effective mean? Um, Professor Harry Somnell covered this beautifully yesterday, and if you did miss that slot, I would advise you to, uh, to watch it on the ISAP website. It was really good. Um, what I mean by effective is that something is based upon scientific evidence of impact. And one of the, the first things that we need to really understand is that not all evidence is the same. On the right hand side, we've got uh, a, char a chart that Harry uh, showed yesterday, uh, and it's the hierarchy of evidence. And um, what this basically says is that some types of evidence is stronger than other types of evidence. So uh, the bottom of that, we've got expert opinion, background information, rising up through case reports, case control studies, to cohort studies, and then to randomized control trials. And they're sometimes called the kind of gold standard of research. But then on top of that, we've got meta-analysis and systematic review. So they're taking multiple studies and looking at the findings of those. So that kind of evidence tends to be stronger or well supported. But other things that we need to consider, are, what about the samples that the, the, the services, uh, that the surveys are, are, are looking at? Are they large enough for us to generalize to all populations or are they restricted to some populations? 
taking all this into consideration, we can then make recommendations on the basis of the evidence on what is effective and not effective for drug use disorder treatment. And recommendations can be of different strength based upon the quality of evidence. Okay, now I want to run through some key issues here. Uh, first off, I'd like to tell you a story. And this is a story about how some study methods are better than others. And uh, this is a story that goes back to the early 2000s. And this is a time when uh, cocaine uh, use disorders were really taking off in many places in the world. And uh, we were looking around for what worked and what didn't work as far as cocaine dependence goes. And there was a study that came out and it was a cohort study and it compared two groups. One group was treatment as usual uh, with auricular acupuncture, and this is the acupuncture in the ears. And the other was treatment as usual without auricular acupuncture. And this study found that treatment with auricular acupuncture actually reduced self-reported withdrawal and cravings for cocaine. So this was really good news. But then some randomized controlled trials were done around this auricular acupuncture. And what happened was that studies compared auricular acupuncture in the correct sites versus auricular acupuncture in sham sites or the wrong holes or the wrong places. And this gave some very interesting results. It gave mixed results, but most of the RCTs showed that there was no better outcomes with auricular acupuncture in the right sites versus the sham sites. And that was really interesting. The other interesting finding from this was that auricular acupuncture, both the sham and the right sites, increased retention in treatment. So clearly something was happening. But what was happening? Well, the researchers concluded that actually the whole experience of auricular acupuncture was having a positive effect, i.e. being sat down, being calm, having a cup of tea, uh, people feeling looked after, etc. But the impact wasn't actually due to the auricular acupuncture in the ears. Some years later, there was a Cochrane review, and that basically con concluded that there is no evidence that auricular acupuncture is effective for the treatment of cocaine dependence. So the conclusion from this is, OK, the more rigorous studies uncovered what was happening and why. And I think we as practitioners and managers need to understand about the evidence and about what impact it can have and why. OK, let's look at another issue. Uh, this is an important issue, and this issue basically flags up to us that no matter what we do, some people will improve regardless, and some people may not respond, and it's not their fault. Um, and I th the, the illustration that I want to use here is, is the numbers needed to treat. Okay, and this is normally done for things like medication, but it can be done for other interventions. And what this basically says is that interventions, including medication, normally only work on a proportion of people. So the graph on the right illustrates at the bottom, some people will recover regardless of what they get. And this is sometimes called the placebo effect. So you can give people something that's not, not effective and it will work. Some people will not respond to treatment. In terms of the people in the middle, this is what we look at in terms of the numbers needed to treat. Now, a definition of numbers needed to treat is the average number of patients who need to have the treatment for one of them to get a positive outcome. And that's a definition by an organization in the UK called NICE. Now, in terms of the, the graph on the right, what this shows was that uh, the 50% improved due to this medication, 25% didn't, uh, uh, didn't, uh, didn't have any impact, and 25% um, got, got better no matter what. So the NNT here is two. And with an NNT, the closer to one, the better. OK, and I've given an example of an NNT for methadone. So this was McCarthy et al. 2010 found that the number needed to treat for methadone was 2.3. So one of the take home messages here is don't blame the patient if they don't respond. We have to try something else. OK, the next point I'd like to make is scientific evidence is of critical importance, but this is about more than scientific evidence. 
Um, and this is illustrated very well through the process of development of guidelines that may be used in countries or local areas or indeed internationally. And what happens here is that scientific evidence is taken, the ethics are taken, regulations or rules may be taken, and that's all put together. And then there needs to be a process of agreement between the scientists, the patients, ideally, the practitioners, the clinicians, the doctors, etc. And then they pull all of that together into the guidelines, then hopefully consult on the guidelines and then finalise it. So it's about more than the scientific evidence, it's how all of that fits together and the interpretation of the scientific evidence. Then I think that what we need to consider is if we have evidence that something works, um, then we need to think about should the recommended intervention be implemented in your system or country? Do you have the infrastructure to implement something? Are there enough competent staff? Uh, does the uh, intervention, is it culturally relevant or does it need adaptation to your particular culture or circumstances? Okay, the other thing I think that we need to think of in terms of uh, impact of uh, uh, whether something works or not is in terms of what is something effective in relation to, i.e. what outcome? And there are a number of different outcomes that may occur and that may, be, may come through scientific evidence. And the outcomes can be anything from reducing risk of harm to retaining people in treatment long enough for them to benefit, to reductions in drug use, to improving health and social functioning, to all the way through to abstinence or prevention of relapse. And an example I've given here is we may expect an intervention to have one uh, outcome, but actually the evidence might be for something else. Um, so, for example, with opioid agonist treatment, we may expect that people will immediately stop all illicit opioid use. But actually the evidence is that uh, it often takes time and that some people may not stop their illicit opioid use at all. Okay, the fifth point I want to make is in terms of patient or client motivation. Now, many of you will be familiar with the Prochaska and Di Clementi cycle of change, but it's really important to realise that this is a model. It's a construct. Yeah? The full model, when it was done by Prochaska and Di Clementi, actually was much more complicated. And if you look at that box of that illustration that I've got on the left-hand side, it looks like a box of spaghetti. And this was the reality of motivation. And what Prochaska and Di Clementi found that there was three dimensions involved, the stages, 10 processes, and then levels of change, and then also several change variables. And when they created their cycle of change, actually they only used the stages of change in the cycle. So it's a partial picture of motivation. So I think that we need to be very careful and uh, beware of imp imposing simplistic models on very complex issues. Um, so some other key points about motivation is that I think we've now got a lot of uh, research coming out that the ability of staff to motivate is often far more powerful than the fluctuating motivation of clients at any one point. Uh, the key, some key research there was done by Fiorentini back in 1990. And I think it's very important not to use a perceived lack of motivation as a barrier for treatment uh, or a reason not to treat or a reason to do nothing. Uh, sometimes if I go around different countries, people think that uh, if somebody's measured as, uh, as pre-contemplative, staff shouldn't do anything. And I actually think that's the opposite. Uh, I think that's an indication that staff should try to do more to motivate. New, some of the newer and more modern theories of motivation may be now more applicable. So, for example, some of the theories from smoking cessation, uh, they, uh, they say things like we need to take advantage of any teachable moment to increase motivation. Okay, the sixth point I want to make is in terms of staff competence and therapeutic alliance. So it's very, very important to use evidence-based psychosocial interventions. Uh, 
But critical to their success is the competence of the staff, i.e. their knowledge, skills and attitudes in being able to deliver the intervention and also their ability to build a therapeutic reliance, uh, alliance or a therapeutic relationship with the patient. And we know that if there is a strong therapeutic alliance, patients tend to have better outcomes. Okay, so now let's have a look at some of the evidence of effectiveness on some critical interventions for people with drug dependence. And I'm going to pull through and mainly reference the interventions that are noted in the International Standards for the Treatment of Drug Use Disorders. I'm also going to focus mainly on uh, uh, drug use uh, dependence syndrome. Okay, so as you know, drug use disorders are spectrum disorders. They range from use or intoxication through to harmful use through to dependence syndrome. Um, and we know that drug use disorders are complex biopsychosocial health disorders, especially dependence, and this impacts on brain and cognitive functioning, impulse control, and the ability to make decisions can be severely compromised. Severe dependence is characterized by a loss of control over drug use. And what this means is that cravings for drugs and prevention of withdrawal symptoms can drive drug use and that using drugs and the resources to acquire drugs can become the priority over previous uh, uh, priorities or things that were very important to people. So it can gain priority over family, health, basic needs, etc. Okay, so the list of treatment interventions that I'm going to look at is just the ones in the red circle due to time. So we're going to briefly look at assessment and treatment planning or, and review or case management, psychosocial interventions, pharmacological interventions and recovery management. And we'll look at what works in relation to these, these things. So the key question I want us to think about here is, how do you give someone who is dependent on drugs the most appropriate evidence-based interventions that will give them the best chance of achieving their goals? Okay, so the first uh, chunk of uh, interventions we're going to look at is assessment and treatment planning. Now, assessment and treatment planning is both evidence-based and ethical. So what we should be doing here is basing people's tra treatment on an, their individual assessment. And the things that we need to look at are the substances they use, the severity of their substance use disorder, their individual circumstances, their other needs or issues, their strengths and what the patient or client wants to achieve. We then need to tailor the patient's treatment to meet the individual need. And the main vehicle for doing that should be a treatment plan with achievable goals that is agreed with the patient, that is regularly reviewed. And evidence is good that that structure is actually beni very beneficial to patients. And it often involves regular meetings with the key, the key worker or the case manager. So what we're saying here is treatment planning and key work are the golden thread that should run through treatment. And indeed, the World Health Organization stressed that if you're giving a pharmacological intervention, uh, this should always be in the context of a treatment plan and always be with psychosocial interventions. All right, now let's look at psychosocial interventions or talking therapies. Let's think about some of the outcomes that we can achieve through psychosocial interventions. Okay, so the international standards say that psychosocial interventions have proven to be effective in increasing treatment retention, increasing adherence to medication, reducing drug use, promoting abstinence and preventing relapse. But it's very, very important here that we consider the severity of somebody's problem, the drugs they use and where they are in their treatment journey. So we know that different types of drug use require different types of psychosocial intervention. We know that different severities of drug use disorders may require different types of psychosocial intervention. 
And we also know that different types of psychosocial intervention may be needed at different points in the patient's treatment journey. So what they get at the beginning of their treatment may be very different to what they get at the end of their journey. Okay. Some of the psychosocial interventions recommended in the international standards are the following. Um, at the side, I've got brief interventions and extended brief interventions, and they use some of the techniques that we've got here on in the boxes in the middle of the slide. So the key psychosocial interventions recommended are cognitive behavioral therapy, Contingency management, which uh, is giving a reward for a, a demonstration of a desired behaviour, and that could be uh, a reward for something like a drug-free urine sample. A community reinforcement approach, motivational interviewing and uh, motivational enhancement therapy, family oriented approach, mutual aid and self-help groups. Okay, now, but we need to really think about how we put these together for people and in systems according to their type of drug use and their severity of drug use disorders. And this is a kind of a complex slide. So I'll walk you through some of the key uh, issues that I'm trying to illustrate here. So on the left hand side, we've got the drugs and here we've just got cannabis and stimulant use and we've got opioid use. We've got the range of psychosocial interventions that we might use that we saw in the previous slide. Everything from brief interventions to key work, motivational interviewing, contingency management, CBT, family interventions and mutual aid. We then need to consider about somebody's severity and complexity of problem. So, for example, if somebody has a cannabis problem that's mild to moderate, what the evidence says that they should get is one to six sessions of a brief intervention or an extended brief intervention. So it's the same for stimulant use. Again, if somebody's got a moderate to severe cannabis or stimulant problem, you're probably there wanting to provide some key work and six to 12 sessions of extended brief interventions and possibly CBT. If somebody's got a severe or complex issue, you're probably looking to provide key work, six to 12 sessions of family interventions, if they've got family around them that are supportive, contingency management for stimulant use, mutual aid and aftercare. Okay, and then if somebody uh, thinking about the setting in terms of cannabis and stimulant use disorders, most of the delivery should be in an outpatient setting with only those with severe or complex needs in an inpatient or residential setting. And even if they have a period of time in inpatient or residential, they should then move to an outpatient setting. With opioids, following this through, if somebody's not in treatment, what the interventions recommended may be are brief interventions, overdose prevention, needle and syringe exchange. If somebody's got a mild problem, we're looking at one to six sessions, a brief intervention or extended brief intervention. And then as they're, as they're moving into moderate or severe, or severe and complex, you're stepping up the amount of psychosocial interventions provided to meet their needs. And then in terms of settings for opioid use disorders, we're looking at for people with mild to moderate or even severe issues, they can be treated in an outpatient setting with inpatient or residential treatments really reserved for those with the most severe or complex need. And that would always need to be followed in an outpatient setting. OK, so it's quite complicated. Now, in terms of psychosocial interventions, different countries make different recommendations in terms of what evidence-based interventions to use. And I'm going to give you the example from my country here, the UK. And when the UK did our clinical guidelines, it's fondly called the orange guidelines because the cover is orange. Um, we actually found that there was much stronger evidence for some types of psychosocial interventions in helping reduce and stop drug use than others. Therefore, our guidelines made stronger recommendations to implement and use these interventions. And the three interventions that came out on top were formal contingency management, behavioral couples therapy, and mutual aid. Very interesting.
And there was weaker evidence for other types of psychosocial interventions. And indeed, the use of some of the other types of psychosocial interventions were even kind of cautioned uh, uh, in, in some circumstances. So, for example, with cognitive behavioral therapy. There was a caution against using cognitive behavioural therapy at certain times. For example, people that were actively stimulant dependent or in the first few months after stimulant use, there was a caution against using formal CBT programmes and that was because of the amount of learning required and the fact that in layman's terms, people's um, learning pathways may be quite disrupted after or during stimulant use and the people may need time to recover those learning pathways. In terms of motivational interviewing, what's called the spirit of motivational interviewing was always thought to be useful, and that's things like active listening, collaboration with the patient, acceptance of what the patient's saying, etc. But formal motivational interviewing was only thought to be useful if somebody was ambivalent or they had low motivation. If it was used when somebody was quite uh, clear about what they wanted to do and motivated. If you use motiva motivational interviewing in those, those circumstances, it could send the behaviour in the wrong direction. Now, an interesting point to note here is many practitioners, uh, they don't actually use formal psychosocial intervention programs such as CBT or contingency management. They may use these techniques uh, but not the formal programs. And if they are only using techniques and not the formal programs, then we may not expect the same level of effectiveness. Okay, let's move to pharmacological interventions. And let's think about withdrawal management. Uh, so what this is, so this is for all substances, and this is helping people physically eliminate drugs from their, or alcohols from their, their bodies in a safe manner. So some of the key points here are with opioid drugs, ideally you'd stabilize them on an opioid drug before withdrawal or detoxification. Evidence-based medication and regimes should always be used. Relapse prevention and psychological, psychosocial support is always required after detox because the risk of relapse is so high. So dependence syndrome is not cured by detoxification. Somebody may not have the drugs in their body, but they will still experience cravings, have difficulty coping, etc. So the psychological dependence is still there. Uh, evidence is clear that enforced detoxification leads to relapse. And there's even evidence that one in 200 people that have been detoxified from opioids that leave prison die of an opioid overdose within three weeks of relapse. And that also may be true of people leaving rehabilitation unit. So we need that follow through and that through care. Let's take a quick look at uh, opioid agonist maintenance treatment, sometimes called opioid medication assisted treatment. So this is for opioid drug use, such as heroin, uh, uh, etc. Okay, so what we're trying to do here are reduce cravings and withdrawal symptoms, reduce injecting, reduce or stop illicit opioid use, reduce crime and uh, provide stability. The drugs that tend to be used that are recommended in the international guidelines are methadone and buprenorphine. Uh, dosing is very important and having uh, people on the right dose that actually suits them and is within the evidence-based recommendations. We have to really beware of underdosing because this sets patients up to fail and they are likely to use illicit opiates on top. Uh, we also need to be aware that illicit opioid use may not stop quickly. It may take people uh, several months and some people actually may not stop at all. The length of opioid medication assisted treatment depends upon what people need. Some people may need many years. Other people may want a period of stability and then they may want to attempt a detox followed by psychosocial interventions and aftercare because they may want to be free of all medication. And then the key point again is enforced detox detoxification will lead to relapse. 
Okay, just to quickly flag up pharmacological interventions for opioid relapse prevention and overdose reversal. So two drugs here that have been proven to be effective. Naltrexone can prevent relapse, but only in those that are motivated to stay opioid free. And really we need somebody to support them in the community to enable compliance. And naloxone, which reverses opioid uh, overdose and can be a real game changer. And this can be used by emergency services, treatment services, people who use drugs and their families, depending on the country legislation about those medications. Let me flag up recovery management interventions. So what we're talking about here is aftercare, recovery checkups, ongoing support, mutual aid or peer support, such as Narcotics Anonymous, 12-step movement, and community reintegration. So what we're trying to do here is help somebody stay abstinent, reduce their risk of relapse, build the community support networks and help them rebuild their lives. And the key points to make are people with moderate to severe, to severe dependence may be at risk of relapse for up to five years after they've become abstinent. So we're talking about long term support for a chronic, possibly relapsing condition. Recovery checkups and aftercare can reduce the risk of relapse. We've got good evidence that mutual aid, such as 12-step support, can significantly reduce the risk of relapse. And also community integration or reintegration and work, etc., can also be highly beneficial. So let me move to my, less, my, la, my last slide and my key take home points. Uh, the first thing is uh, first do no harm, the Hippocratic Oath. We need to really recognize that treatment is not neutral. We can cause more harm than good if we're not ethical, evidence-based and patient-focused. So key things are treatment is a partnership with the patient. The therapeutic alliance is key and staff competence is key. Treatment should be tailored to individual patient need, to the substances they use, the severity of use, their needs, strengths, goals, and what they want and where they are in their journey. We have a toolbox of science-based interventions that can increase the likelihood that patients may achieve their desired outcomes. But we need to put these interventions together, both in terms of treatment systems and individual treatment paths, to create the best possible chance that uh, we're providing evidence-based interventions for all of the patients out there. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Anete. What an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, taking us through, you've been able to let us have a better understanding of what uh, evidence based is as far as uh, scientific uh, impact is uh, uh, concerned. Uh, also drawing the inference from the, the, the base uh, that is talking of uh, uh, expert opinion to the highest level of uh, evidence. Uh, the meta-analysis and systematic uh, uh, review, also helping us to look at the different aspect of what works as far as uh, uh, treatment uh, interventions are concerned, uh, psychosocial intervention, and uh, pharmacotherapeutic uh, uh, interventions. And Anita, you made us to have uh, at least so many takeaways, and one of which is that uh, don't blame the patient if they do not respond, just try something else. That is speaking from experience and speaking evidence. Thank you so much. And uh, you also made us to understand that uh, when we talk of uh, um, how effective, of course, it is in relation to different uh, outcomes, uh, uh, reduce, uh, reduce uh, uh, risk and of course harm. Uh, retention in treatment and uh, reduction in substance use among uh, others. So what a wonderful presentation once again. Uh, we'll be taking questions uh, later on. So please uh, uh, be uh, on standby, uh, waiting for the time for questions. I will also do some uh, wrap up at the end of uh, the other speakers' uh, presentation so that uh, we make a good uh, summary of today's uh, session. 
So briefly, we'll move to the next um, uh, part of this uh, section, as the second part of this uh, session. Uh, we shall be looking at uh, case studies from two countries on how the evidence-based principles for treatment have been applied. Uh, the first one is from uh, principles to practice uh, a case study of treatment provision in Mexico. And this presentation will be taken in Spanish. Uh, please use the guide provided for the translation. And uh, to lead in this discussion is uh, Ramiro Velez. Ramiro, please uh, let us see you put on your camera. Ramiro, can you hear me? Hola, buenos dias. Oh, great. Good to know you again. Uh, Ramiro is the director of CIJ Chihuahua, that is ISOP Mexico. Uh, Ramiro is a surgeon by training from the Institute of Biological Sciences of the Osmos University of Ciudad Juarez. He holds a master's degree in administration for civil society organizations from the Technological Institute of Higher Studies of Monterrey, among other academic and professional uh, qualifications. Uh, he is currently the regional director of youth integration centers in Chihuahua and head of the treatment commission of the state council against addiction for the state of Chihuahua. He is an honorary member and president of the Addiction Commission of the Council for the Social Development and Citizen Participation. He belongs to many professional bodies with multiple speaking opportunities. Please join me to welcome Ramiro. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Gracias a todos. Este, un placer. Muchísimas gracias a ISUP que nos permite el, el día de hoy. Este, precisamente estar ahí con ustedes. Eh, no sé si, si ven la presentación ya, ¿verdad? Eh, vamos a iniciar precisamente. Eh, quiero felicitar a, a, a la ponente anterior, a Anet, eh, por su exposición muy clara, muy, muy importante. Este, y vamos a hablar un poquito de lo mucho que ella habló precisamente de, de y, y vamos a trasladar a México precisamente el, lo, algunos, algunas situaciones o casos que hemos estado nosotros eh, trabajando desde centros de integración juvenil eh, aquí en Chihuahua y a nivel nacional, precisamente, es, es, es una directriz tal cual y, y yo creo que todos lo hemos visto en donde eh, tenemos que tratar de manera conjunta el trastorno por uso de sustancias y a la par tenemos que tratar eh, los trastornos de la salud mental. Y es precisamente eh, donde desde hace años estamos tratando de manera coordinada a través de este modelo de patología dual y, y sobre todo a través de este abordaje multidisciplinario y a través de este abordaje transdisciplinario. Entonces, eh, si, si me permiten, eh, para, para irnos a la, directamente a la, a la presentación, este, para, para avanzar las diapositivas, listo. Ya lo comentó Anet precisamente en donde eh, hablar precisamente en, en México de, de estos de, de la revisión de metaanálisis, de la revisión de las guías, eh, de, de las guías clínicas en México también tenemos guías clínicas. Yo creo que es muy importante que podamos nosotros eh, hablar eh, también de las situaciones, de las evidencias que se han presentado a lo largo del tratamiento. Es importante comentarles que Centros de Integración Juvenil tiene más de 50 años en el tratamiento de, de las adicciones y que desde entonces también la institución en conjunto con la Comisión Nacional de Atención a las Adicciones en México se, ha, se han logrado precisamente este, estas guías y, y, y se toma en cuenta mucho esta parte de la evidencia clínica. Sin embargo, una de las situaciones eh, más importantes en México que tenemos o bien una de las limitantes es que muchas eh, precisamente del Cochrane, de las revisiones sistemáticas, 
de, eh, vienen eh, los datos en, en, en inglés y en muchas ocasiones esta parte de la adaptación o, eh, eh, resulta a veces un poquito complicado, existen pocos estudios que están adaptados para la población en Latinoamérica, sin embargo, eh, nuestras guías clínicas nos permiten precisamente el que podamos personalizar aún más esta parte del tratamiento. Este, una de, uno de los aspectos este, muy, muy importantes es que Centros de Integración Juvenil tiene eh, esta, no solamente la parte de la vigilancia epidemiológica, sino que también se hace una revisión sistemática a cada uno de a cada una de las eh, eh, a cada una de las eh, intervenciones que se han manejado eh, eh, sí es importante conocer como lo comentaba Ned este hacer esas revisiones a través de, de, de muchos de estos buscadores que tenemos lo vamos a comentar un poquito más adelante no me voy a detener en esto precisamente porque Anet fue muy clara qué es la medicina basada en evidencias, ese es el proceso precisamente a través del cual el personal de salud va a precisamente poder mejorar su toma de decisiones, eh, sobre todo en el aspecto clínico, a través de la evidencia científica de la que se dispone. Es importante comentar eh, la experiencia clínica del profesional, lo comentaban las preferencias, las características del propio paciente, y por supuesto, las circunstancias tal cual de, de, de la persona que asiste como tal a tratamiento. En, 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 el, en, en México existe un, un apartado tipo Cochrane, de, precisamente se le llama acá en México la medicina de, de precisión, en donde se busca atender, se busca personalizar el tratamiento. Y una de las situaciones más importantes, eh, ya, ya lo comentaba Anet en su plática anterior, pues es obviamente re, revisar toda esta parte de la evidencia científica en lo que respecta al tratamiento, este, reconocer toda esta parte del, del expertise, de la experiencia clínica y obviamente considerar siempre los valores, las preferencias como tal del paciente. Uno de los aspectos muy importantes aquí en México definitivamente es el análisis de costo. Lo, lo comentamos no solamente por el hecho del acceso a tratamiento, sino también por el hecho de la farmacoterapia. El uso de medicamentos precisamente en los síndromes de intoxicación, en, eh, 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 sobre todo, como lo comentaba Anet, en los síndromes de abstinencia, pues ya está revisado que tiene un efecto muy importante. Sin embargo, no todos los pacientes pueden accesar precisamente o disponer de todos los recursos para poder emplear todo el abordaje farmacológico sobre todo en lo que respecta en el síndrome de abstinencia. Eh, sin embargo, eh, uno de los aspectos más importantes y es en los que quiero centrar eh, la presentación es precisamente que tenemos que considerar también desde la farmacoterapia el abordaje de la patología dual. Cuando hacemos esto, estamos integrando no solamente a más profesionales de la salud en, en, en el tratamiento, sino estamos eh, precisamente eh, logrando reducir la recaída al tratar en muchas ocasiones lo que pudiera ser el problema raíz. Eh, eh, en, en, en España eh, existe la, la sociedad eh, de patología dual. Algunos médicos aquí en México estamos inscritos tal cual, pero para poder realmente intervenir eh, en, con, con toda esta situación de la medicina basada en evidencia, es muy importante for, eh, formalizar o formular estas eh, cinco preguntas que nos van a ayudar precisamente a aplicar la mejor evidencia para nuestros pacientes. La primera es formular como tal la pregunta que a veces resulta difícil, lo vamos a ver ahorita un poquito más adelante de manera más, más, más detallada. Obviamente vamos a localizar la, la mejor evidencia científica disponible, podemos o debemos analizar críticamente la evidencia. Comentaba Ned, por ejemplo, el, el, el ejercicio, el, el estudio que se hizo en la auriculoterapia, en, este, en donde no ha mostrado precisamente que sea propiamente eh, eh, en la acción de la auriculoterapia la que, la que va a ayudar precisamente al paciente. Entonces tenemos que aplicar toda esta parte de la evidencia y sobre todo tenemos que darle seguimiento y evaluar el progreso de la persona en, en, en los servicios de la atención. Y como lo comentamos, en, en, en el internamiento, 
El tratamiento no termina cuando terminan su proceso de internamiento. El paciente tendrá que continuar en, en un proceso de servicio de tratamiento ambulatorio o tipo consulta externa con la intención no solamente de disminuir la probabilidad de recaída, sino de continuar con ese proceso de rehabilitación y de reinserción social. Entonces, eh, para, para generar la pregunta, porque les digo que, que, que a veces resulta difícil, eh, se utiliza aquí en México eh, algunos acrónimos, se utiliza este, este acrónimo que se llama Sistema PICO, eh, eh, con, con la P estamos viendo el, el paciente como tal o la población a la que la intervención se va a dirigir, ¿verdad? Este, entonces, eh, la P... Eh, significa paciente o población, la I significa intervención, la C significa eh, precisamente en donde vamos a comparar nosotros precisamente eh, eh, los resultados como tal, eh, a eso se define la O como el outcome, eh, el desenlace o bien eh, los resultados que, que, que podría tener nuestra intervención. Cuando nosotros formulamos precisamente eh, esta pregunta e integramos este acrónimo en México para ver cuál es nuestro paciente, cuál es la intervención que según la evidencia científica pudiera tener el mejor impacto y obviamente comparar, hacer esta revisión precisamente crítica de las intervenciones que estamos utilizando y vamos a poder en el seguimiento del caso pues valorar toda esta parte del resultado. Sí es muy importante comentar que, que, que para el paciente es, es, es muy efectiva que revisemos esta parte de cuál es la intervención más adecuada que vamos a utilizar y en este sentido, en la revisión crítica de la evidencia científica, es muy importante que podamos comparar y, y ver a lo largo de la evolución del tratamiento los resultados. Es, esto nos va a ayudar no solamente a, a, a presentar un plan de tratamiento para el paciente, sino nos va a ayudar también, nos va a ayudar también para mejorar la parte de la adherencia terapéutica con el paciente. Entonces, eh, ¿cómo, ¿cómo podemos en México? Les digo, platicaba yo con Jeff, platicaba yo previamente, me, me pedían que hablara precisamente de algunas de las dificultades precisamente que se presentan en México. Cuando, cuando nosotros eh, aquí en México este, estamos revisando algunos artículos a través precisamente de algunos de los buscadores, aquí, aquí podemos buscar precisamente mucho de la evidencia. Ustedes conocen eh, precisamente la revisión de metaanálisis eh, eh, a través precisamente de estas apps o de, 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 de estas eh, eh, librerías tal cual. Eh, podemos eh, conocer cuál, cuáles son los resultados que han presentado algunas de estas intervenciones en, en estudios de metaanálisis en un gran número precisamente de pacientes y podemos adecuar. Sin embargo, les, les comentaba yo, una de las limitantes en México es que desgraciadamente, eh, en la, eh, si, si no lees en inglés, pues, pues ya estamos atrasados cinco años. Eh, eh, si, si, no, si, no, si no estamos aplicando precisamente, si no estamos adaptando o si no nos estamos actualizando este, precisamente de manera constante, pues estamos retrasando un poquito. Entonces, yo creo que una de las principales limitantes que tenemos en México, en Latinoamérica, es precisamente que tenemos un desfase aproximadamente de cinco años para cuando estamos eh, eh, nosotros llevando a las guías clínicas precisamente eh, lo, lo que se maneja en Europa, lo que se maneja en Estados Unidos, en, 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 en Inglaterra precisamente, en algunos otros países que, que tienen una mayor investigación. Otra de las limitantes definitivamente que tenemos en México es que, que no tenemos toda la investigación que quisiéramos para poder adaptar de manera a, a, al contexto mexicano o latinoamericano precisamente, la, 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 el, precisamente los resultados de las intervenciones que estemos aplicando. Pero a través precisamente de estos buscadores, a través de estas aplicaciones, pues podemos nosotros precisamente localizar cuál sería la, la, la mejor evidencia. Si nos vamos al tercer paso de, de lo que platicamos a la hora de, de formular la pregunta y, al, y sobre todo al hablar de un plan de tratamiento muy específico, pues tenemos precisamente otros checklists con los que podamos evaluar críticamente esta parte de la evidencia. Estas ya tienen un menor sesgo, obviamente. Son estudios que están ya muchísimo más probados y, y que pueden demostrar tal cual toda esta parte de la eficacia. 
Sin embargo, volvemos con esta parte de la limitante en cuanto específicamente a la adaptación para la población mexicana. Cada vez se suman más instituciones. Tenemos a la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México que ha buscado adaptar muchos, eh, 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 precisamente, eh, no, no solamente los estudios, hablemos precisamente de las escalas o de los instrumentos que nos ayudan eh, al hecho de buscar una depresión, el hecho de buscar un, un trastorno de ansiedad a la par, que lo vamos a ver un poquito más adelante, este, ya, ya han sido adaptadas para la población mexicana y que nos ayudan precisamente, eh, eh, no, no solamente a, a tener un, un tratamiento para toda esta parte comórbida, sino para realmente mejorar precisamente eh, el, el tratamiento, llevarlo de manera integral. Eh, el, al, al aplicar nosotros la evidencia en el cuarto punto, estaríamos nosotros hablando de cuál es la factibilidad del tratamiento. Es decir, este tratamiento es, es, es el mejor para el paciente. Algo importante que comentaba ahorita Anet es que siempre tenemos que, que, que tener eh, en consideración eh, todas esas alternativas disponibles y obviamente revisar toda esta parte de los beneficios potenciales para el paciente recordando eh, eh, el principio de no dañar el, 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 el juramento hipocrático que, que algunos médicos este, conocen bien en ese sentido. Pero algo muy importante es realmente reconocer la opinión de mi paciente, es ver cómo está realmente el paciente evolucionando, tomar en consideración todos estos aspectos que, que nos permitan dar cuenta precisamente, no solamente que estamos aplicando la mejor evidencia, sino que estamos precisamente mejorando con mucho la efectividad, uno una de, de los aspectos importantes es, es que ANET precisamente manejaba de, de que tenemos que hablar de efectividad del proceso. ¿Cómo voy yo realmente a medir, a evaluar la efectividad del proceso y del tratamiento? Y no solamente eh, ligado solamente en el uso de sustancias, sino a través precisamente de, de, de ese bienestar de, del paciente. Y, y en este sentido... Este, aquí algo de la, de la literatura precisamente para, para las tres preguntas. En, en este aspecto, oh, hablando nuevamente del tema de la patología dual, uno de los aspectos más importantes es que en México, precisamente, eh, desgraciadamente, el presupuesto para la salud mental se encuentra muy por debajo de lo que recomienda la Organización Mundial de la Salud. Ustedes saben que la Organización Mundial de la Salud recomienda que se aplique eh, del, presu del, del presupuesto total de salud pública, que se, que se aplique al menos el 10% para uh, salud mental. Sin embargo, en México no alcanzamos a veces ni el 1%. En, en, en está, esto está demostrado y existen muchos otros países también que tienen estas carencias y, y, y no solamente en la parte del presupuesto, sino también en, en el acceso a los servicios de tratamiento especializado. Existe un número de psiquiatras eh, limitado también, con lo cual esta situación a veces se complica. Entonces, eh, eh, sí es muy importante que, que nosotros, precisamente cuando aplicamos, precisamente cuando revisamos nuestras guías de, 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 nuestras guías de, de evidencia clínica, nuestras guías de práctica clínica, pues esto nos va a ayudar con mucho a mejorar nuestros diagnósticos, es, es importante en México, en Latinoamérica, que podamos utilizar todos aquellos instrumentos clínicos que estén adaptados para la población. Esto va a ayudar a profesionalizar el tratamiento y va a ayudar a mejorar la, como tal, el, eh, no, no solamente el, el, el diagnóstico. Cuando no tenemos un diagnóstico, no tendríamos que iniciar esa parte del tratamiento. Entonces, sí es muy importante que podamos integrar a, a los equipos, al médico, al psicólogo, al psiquiatra, a la trabajadora social, eh, precisamente todo este equipo multi, eh, multidisciplinario y que podamos llevar un ejercicio transdisciplinario para mejorar precisamente este tema en, en, en lo que respecta a tratamiento. Y es por eso que yo insisto mucho en este tema de la patología dual. Ustedes han hablado, eh, conocen precisamente el tema de la patología dual. No me voy a detener mucho en la definición. Es, es la concurrencia de un diagnóstico psiquiátrico junto con un trastorno por uso de sustancias, que generalmente el, el trastorno por uso de sustancias ocurre en el orden del consumo patológico o en el orden de la dependencia. Eh, eh, eh. Sin embargo, este, hay un gran número también de casos 
que, que, que cursan, sino ya con una dependencia, con un consumo problemático y que en muchas ocasiones cursan a la par con un trastorno depresivo, con un trastorno de ansiedad generalizada o algún otro. Entonces, como tal, a, a, a nivel mundial ya, ya se ha utilizado este término dual, eh, no para hablar de la combinación de dos padecimientos, en psiquiatría está reservado específicamente para estas dos condiciones. La coexistencia en un mismo momento de un trastorno psiquiátrico y de un trastorno por uso de sustancias. Cuando tenemos estas dos, que es muy común, ahorita vamos a revisar lo que dicen los metanálisis, ahorita hablan que en más del 80% de los pacientes presentan a la par este, este diagnóstico dual, tiene una prevalencia entonces muy alta, pero también tiene un significado pronóstico. Estos pacientes no solamente son más difíciles de tratar, son pacientes generalmente que tienen una mayor tasa de recaídas, son pacientes que requieren de estas intervenciones mucho más amplias y este, que el hecho, el solo hecho de considerar este tema de la patología dual ya nos va a ayudar a ampliar estas formulaciones diagnósticas y por consecuencia nos va a ayudar en la toma de decisiones. Eh, un, un tema aquí muy, muy importante, ¿qué fue primero? El, ¿El trastorno por uso de sustancias y vino después el, 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 el trastorno mental? ¿O fue primero el trastorno mental que hizo más vulnerable a mi paciente en, en, en el uso de sustancias? Realmente, en, a, al hablar de, de los resultados, y no, no importa qué fue primero, no importa si fue primero el huevo o la gallina, lo importante es que reconozcamos la coexistencia en un mismo momento de estas dos situaciones que podamos nosotros realmente brindar un tratamiento integral. Este, ahorita vamos a ver algunos de los estudios que se han hecho en México que hablan este, precisamente de, de, de trastornos de ansiedad, trastornos depresivos, algunos otros trastornos concurrentes que, que precisamente nos, nos ayudan a mejorar esta parte del tratamiento. Miren, en la diapositiva vemos... Eh, en el caso específico, hablando de este tema de, de diferenciar incluso por el género. Ramiro. Sí. So, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you may begin to wrap up. Thank you. Ah, ok. Sí, nada más hablar precisamente de, de la prevalencia precisamente tan alta de estos, de estos trastornos mentales que concurren, este, ya, ya comentamos de esas complicaciones de la comorbilidad y este, hablar eh, que tenemos que personalizar precisamente esta parte del tratamiento, no centrado en las sustancias, sino centrarlo precisamente en, 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 en la persona. Yo creo que es, es la situación más importante e incorporar siempre este tema de la patología dual en el tema de las sustancias. Agradecer, agradecer a ustedes el, el, el espacio precisamente a, a ISUP, agradecer la oportunidad que, que, que nos permiten estar aquí con ustedes y, y, y nada, este, poner, ponerme a, a disposición de ustedes. Muchísimas gracias por su atención. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ramiro, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. At least uh, you portrayed uh, the points made by Annette earlier on with practical uh, experience. Uh, you also talked about uh, the need for individual approach to, to, to treatment, interventions, and of course the, the challenges you know, in adaptation as well as uh, budget uh, uh, constraint. So thank you for sharing the experience from uh, uh, Mexico. So because of time, we'll move straight to the next uh, uh, presenter. Thank you. So the next speaker is uh, Bilal Ahmed. Uh, Bilal, uh, let's, uh, please put on your uh, camera. Bilal, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, Bilal Ahmed, uh, Ahmed is the program director, SPYM, ISOP uh, India. 
uh, Bilaha's uh, expertise in the areas of uh, program planning and management, uh, on-site support, capacity building, and concurrent uh, assessment of drug demand reduction uh, projects. Uh, currently, uh, Bila has been providing mentoring support in implementing uh, some child intervention efficacy and study among the marginalized population groups, including children and juveniles with substance use uh, disorders. Uh, before his current assignment, uh, Bila was a national consultant with the National AIDS Control Organization, Ministry of Health and Family uh, Welfare, Government of India, and of course, uh, UNICEF. He was in charge of uh, overall program management of the countrywide Red Ribbon Express project on HIV prevention among youth and women, life skills education program for adolescents or in school and among out of school youth on drug and HIV. So Bila is a trainer on child drug addiction treatment curriculum of the Colombo Plan Drug Advisory uh, Program. Please join me as I invite Bila to take it off from here. Thank you. I hope I'm audible and my presentation is uh, is on display. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful to uh, ISAP International for uh, you know conducting this conference and for me to have this opportunity to make this presentation. I'm also grateful to my parent organization SPYM based in Delhi, and we are the ISAP. Uh, India chapter as well. So it's a great opportunity. I'm grateful. So with that, I will make this presentation. This presentation is going to talk about our work with the juveniles uh, and children in India, uh, in Delhi, which is the capital city of uh, India. So this is where we are working and we are working with the juveniles in Delhi. So I will focus primarily on the challenges that we have had in this journey since 2010 and i'll also share the components of this intervention this program that we are running among the juveniles uh, i will also conclude with the some of the recognition that we have had at the national level uh, from government of india uh, for doing this work and for working among the juveniles and children in india The Society for Promotion of Youth and Masses is a organization. Uh, it's uh, around more. We have been working for more than three and a half decades, and we are uh, we have started working with adults, juveniles, and children and women on substance use uh, since 1986. But we have been working primarily among juveniles since last 2000, uh, since around uh, 10, 11 years since 2010. Uh, I'll just give you a very brief information about the scenario of drug use among uh, children in India. I'll not get into the details of it. This is the only study which was done in 2011, 2012-13. And this study spoke of uh, and found the nature of drug use among the children. And some findings I'll just share. I'll not get into the details of them. Uh, the primary drug which is being used most often by the subs by the children is the are the inhalants solvents followed by tobacco alcohol cannabis and pharmaceutical opioids uh, heroin we call it and smack is the local name for the heroin as well uh, there is a high risk behavior which is the exchange of uh, sex in exchange for drugs it was also found very common among the children. This were children uh, below 18 years of age. 
treatment seeking behavior is quite low almost uh, 70 percent children never sought any kind of uh, support for treatment only around seven percent children were in contact with some ngo uh, seeking any kind of support uh, reasons for drug use uh, is primarily peer pressure uh, there were other factors which is uh, family uh, familiar uh, risk factors which include substance use among one of the more family members which is more than 50 percent conflict within the family and abuse domestic abuse uh, within the family was as well is very common um, experimentation is uh, one more factor among the adolescents being the impressionable age group also some of them are into drug use because they would want to escape from the daily and routine problems uh, obviously lack of positive role models uh, we are talking about the population as far as the juveniles are concerned and the children are concerned where these indicators were quite low uh, primarily among the street children the children who are living uh, on the streets uh, neglect and lack of attention from the parents uh, I'm talking about this program that I am presenting. This is a program or project. Uh, it's in-house, um, uh, you know, it's an in-house facility for the juveniles. Uh, this was uh, this uh, in. I'm referring to a, a study uh, to, to study the problem in 2009. 2009. What juvenile justice committee, honourable uh, Delhi High Court. In Delhi, what they did, they constituted a committee because they observed a lot of drug use among the children. And this was uh, followed in 2010. Uh, the Chief Justice of Delhi High Court uh, was attacked in a children's observation home in Delhi. And that incident was an eye opener. So judiciary became quite conscious and cautious about doing something about children. I wanted to particularly know uh, what may have caused uh, a child to get into this kind of uh, violent behavior and what could be the reasons because during that period there was increased drug use being seen among the juveniles so they wanted to know more and that's why this committee was constituted in 2009 to understand the problem more uh, in uh, 2010 it's in 2011 uh the delhi honorable uh, high court the judiciary asked the state government to do something and start some center and that's when we came into the picture we were already working among adults on substance use and dependence so we were asked to start the center of course uh, despite the recognition by the judiciary that there is a problem and something has to be done and the state being requested and directed to do something and start some center the delhi government asked us to start the center without any financial support without any financial liability on their part so however given our commitment to this cause we started the center without any support in 2010. Uh, 2010 the center was started and it was formally uh, you know inaugurated as well in 2010 itself uh, referring to some of the challenges that we have been facing during this entire journey of working with the juveniles um, in this center uh, there is a lack of support and there has been a lack of support from the government right from the beginning uh, I would say at an individual level, when we are talking about a drug uh, drug person who is dependent on drugs, there's a lot of denial at that level that the person feels, and it's in denial in the context of feeling that the child, the person is in any kind of dependence. We have had the same kind of experience with the government. The government did not want to support, uh, rather acknowledge that there is a problem because acknowledgement is the first step towards doing something about uh, the particular issue or a particular problem so for them it was easy not to even acknowledge that there is a problem of drug use among the juveniles or in the ch among the children in delhi so there was complete lack of support from the government there was no funding 
even the support that was provided in the form of a letter the uh, SPYM was asked to open the center without any kind of financial support at all so uh, so that was initially in 2010 that's how we started there was no funding for three years we have started the center in 2010 and in, or almost 2014-15 as i'm talking with you right now there is no financial support there is a partial support from the government of uh, delhi but uh, initially it's uh, for almost three or four years there was no funding support at all uh, there was also suitable lack of suitable space and adequacy of space in the treatment facility there was no kitchen there were no washrooms so initially we started in a structure which was um, actually an old coat which was converted into a treatment center so uh, uh, there was hardly anything in terms of uh, being suitable for the children to live uh, leave alone being able to provide any kind of uh, you know treatment uh, support in the particular facility uh, we have been facing a lot of issues in the context of reintegration of children into the family uh, we are talking about a juvenile who has lost his most prime age when he or she should be in the school or studying or playing um, and the child has been into crime child has been on the streets and child has initiated into drug use and into the crime as well so because of this the family gets into a lot of issues and faces a lot of issues particularly uh, when it comes gets into the legal uh, tangle and when there is uh, when there are police cases when there is when there is a court gets engaged gets involved then family get goes through a living hell so when they bring the, uh, when ultimately a child is being caught and they are brought to these juvenile centers uh, our center gets children from the juvenile justice board and uh, it's a magisterial order through which the child comes to our center once they are caught in some offense on the street and also have the history of drug use so having said so when they come to our center family in some cases sadly actually do not want the child back so reintegration with the family is uh, very difficult and quite challenging we have very limited resources we have had limited resources right from the beginning and manpower as well uh, particularly to support the follow-up to, uh, to support the aftercare anita ma'am in the beginning spoke so well about the evidence-based uh, practices that need to be uh, there in the program uh, so in that context the follow-up aftercare is uh, quite challenging for us given the resources and the manpower that we have uh, another challenge is in the context of resources available for providing livelihood support please understand we are talking about the children who are with us till the age of 18 and once they leave our center so they would like to be engaged in some lively uh, some some uh, some uh, vocational programs some program in which which will take care of their daily cash needs and that will take care of their livelihood as well so it has been quite a challenge for us to take care of such need because we are talking about almost four and a half thousand children who have been treated in our center in the last uh, 10 years government of india now recently uh, just a brief but I would like to share 2001, 2002, there was a study at the national level on drug use across the country uh, that gave the national figures. 2012, 13, I spoke of a small study which was done among the children. Uh, 2018, 19, most recently, there was a study done at the national level to understand the extent and pattern of substance use in India. That brought out a lot of uh, issues. For example, it just spoke of uh, Delhi itself has almost 95,000 children who are into inhalant drug use in Delhi. So when these figures came into the notice at the national level, somehow now, most recently we have seen the government of India has uh, woken up and they have got, uh, they have recognized that drug use is a problem and it has to be dealt with. At present, there's a lack of, uh, still there is a lack of efficient policy framework for addressing substance use, particularly among uh, children, juveniles and adolescents. Children themselves are concerned about their future because when they are in a center and they are going through the uh, therapeutic uh, sessions and they are going through uh, routine um, assessments and, and so on, 
a uh, lot of life skill based education and so on they they are concerned about their future they're concerned about uh, after they are done with the center and they are out of the center how do they deal with the fact that they may relapse so that is their apprehension how do they deal with their own family which sometimes may not want them back how do they deal with the neighborhood where uh, community in within the communities the drug use is quite high there is an apprehension that they may go back to drug use once they are back into their communities uh, so there is a lack of uh, support acceptance on the part of the family and particularly schools in most cases the juveniles that we are talking about do not go back to the school at all because they have missed on that opportunity for almost 10 years getting back to the school sitting with a kid who may be just 10 years younger than them and they may be in the same uh, class so it's difficult for them to deal with that reality so most of the children uh, because of lack of acceptance in particular and because of having the uh, being in conflict with law being into you know having been having the police record most of the children are not able to go back to the school there is a stigma faced by juveniles in the society as well some children with mental health issues do need specialized care we do have some linkages that we take care of but it's it's also a challenge children take to take tend to take some time to open up uh, because they come from the streets and they have certain experiences and trauma that they may have gone through uh, i'll not go get into the details of this these are the components of the services that we provide at our center uh, it includes uh, screening it includes the 12 step program up to follow up and so on some vocational training yoga meditation games and so on we give a lot of focus on art music dance therapies as well uh, to ensure that the children stay uh, engaged at the center uh, spm has partnered with the university of north carolina we are doing a uh, we are doing a study in which we would like to understand and learn more about our intervention because we are also learning through the process and this will help us to learn more about how efficiently and how effective our intervention is with the children uh, we have advocated and contributed in a big way at the national level with national action plan uh, and it has a component which is to set up a program particularly for the women and children in uh, across the country uh, it also has a component which talks about drop-in and outreach outreach and drop-in center model adapted and scaled up at the um, uh, government of india at the national level uh, we have been able to successfully succeed in having public health setup of detoxification services for children and juveniles in some government hospitals around 60 beds have been reserved for the children uh, recently uh, we have been recognized uh, we have had the award of 2015 from the president of india uh, again i'm grateful to uh, all of you the audience for giving me this opportunity and ICEP as well. Uh, with these words, thank you. I'm grateful to each one of you uh, for such patient listening. Thank you. Uh, there's a website uh, which uh, has perhaps more information. Uh, thank you, Mila, for that uh, excellent uh, uh, presentation. Uh, especially speaking uh, from experience uh, uh, about substance use among uh, uh, treatments among uh, uh, the young uh, We're sorry, everybody. We just have um, had some technical difficulties. 
with Martin. We we'll just wait a couple of moments and we will have a stand in moderator. So bear with us. The technology has decided to let us down this afternoon. Whilst we're waiting to see um, if Jeff is with us, um, could we have the speakers turn their cameras back on for the Q&A session? So, so if they hear me now. Ah, there we go. Everybody's back. <laughs> I'll hand it back over to you, Martin. Yeah, so sorry. <laughs> Surprise, you know, technology. Yes, anything can just happen at any time. Apology for that. <laughs> so, straight, uh, we go to the um, uh, Q and A uh, session. I will have uh, a couple of questions here, and uh, I, I will just look at the questions and uh, I'll call on the, the presenters to, to respond to the questions. One of the questions here is asking about um, evidence-based approaches to treatment make sense, but how do we transfer this knowledge to the practitioners who have uh, limited access to training and support? Uh, how realistic uh, it is that those Working with SUDs uh, can assess them, learn, understand, and apply this in their work. Now we are uh, one way or the other. So, link is uh, to practice. Uh, I think uh, uh, the three uh, uh, speakers can respond to this, uh, maybe one after the other. Thank you. Okay, Annette, you can take it up first. Uh, so how do we translate these evidence-based um, uh, principles uh, to practice? Ah, that's a great question, and it's a big question. Um, it's a $65 million question, I think, really. Um, uh, I think that from, from my perspective, it needs a number of things. Um, it needs uh, leadership to do it. Um, because I think that these things have to be planned um, and that's either planned at a national level or a provincial level or by the treatment provider themselves. Um, and um, I think that then there is, a, that I think it's, it's looking at then what the implementation steps would be so uh, does the service has the correct uh, policies and procedures in place for an implementation? Uh, are the staff competent or do they need training? Um, uh, are there data requirements that are needed? Um, and I think it's actually a, a, pla a, it's a detailed planning piece in order to get something in place. Are the resources there to do it, et cetera? So uh, for me, it's a, it's a something that needs to be very consciously planned um, and uh, ideally uh, it needs good leadership um, and uh, yeah so th that's kind of my answer on that one. Thank you very much Annette. So uh, Bilal would you like to say something? Uh, I just uh, agree. I, I can't agree more. The leadership is extremely important. I just, just said in the beginning itself, that has been a case with us as well. Uh, leadership and also a lot of follow up and coordination. Uh, you need a lot of stakeholders to come together and then uh, have a comprehensive response at a community level, at a state level, to because it needs more. Um, the more partners we have, the better it is. Hola, buenos días. Sí, en, en, en atención a la pregunta de Jeff, 
Este, yo creo que, que existen algunas limitantes en México respecto al acceso a la información, este, pero como profesionistas pues tenemos que estar precisamente eh, eh, capacitándonos de manera permanente eh, con la intención de, de, de lograr precisamente mejorar los resultados en materia de tratamiento y sobre todo incluir en, en la parte de los diagnósticos todos estos instrumentos clínicos con los que contamos hacer uso de estos instrumentos para poder integrar un diagnóstico, hacerlo de manera mucho más integral con la intención de que esto tenga un mejor impacto. Definitivamente eh, tenemos que revisar toda esta parte de la evidencia científica, tenemos que aplicar precisamente lo que sí está funcionando y ver precisamente de esta información cuál de esta está adaptada para la población en la que residimos, para la población en este caso mexicana, y que nosotros podamos intervenir cada vez de manera mucho más eficaz este, para, para lograr mejores resultados. Ok, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ramiro. Thank you, Martín. So, uh, good. We move to the next uh, question. Um, this is asking, uh, what is the optimal duration of uh, inpatient for severe uh, cases of substance use uh, uh, disorders? So what would be uh, the optimal duration uh, for treatment of uh, uh, severe cases of uh, uh, substance use uh, uh, disorders? Or complex uh, cases as is put here. So, But uh, my understanding is uh, what would be the optimal duration of uh, inpatient for substance use disorders? Okay, go ahead, Annette. I think that this is a really interesting question um, because um, uh, certainly in my country, there's been lots of attempts to time limit treatment because of the costs. So it's an interesting question to have. Um, I don't think that there is a straight answer Um, because I think people need treatment for as long as they need it. And um, it's a very individualized thing. So um, I don't think that you should say, okay, uh, uh, X person has to have this and that's all they get. I understand that some health services, insurance systems, etc., put time limits on things. But um, for me, I think one of the key things to consider is that uh, severe and complex drug use disorders are complex and relapsing conditions. And if we take an approach that looks at time-limited episodes, it's probably the wrong way to look at it. It's, I think that we need to re-envisage our systems as to how we can provide treatment over a, and, and support over a longer time period some of which may be intense and some of which may not be intense. So uh, don't time limit, organize your system to cope with a chronic and relapsing condition. And I think that there's no straight answer to this. It depends on individual need. Thank you very much, Annette. Uh, Bilal, would you like to say something? Uh, I, I agree with Anita, it's not a, Uh, it, there's no straight answer for this because it, it depends on an individual. Two, uh, we do have a lot of children we, uh, who do come back. We have a lot of repeat visits and uh, we would never ever close the doors. Uh, two, uh, which I would like to certainly emphasize is the in the context of continuum, it's very essential to link uh, children with support groups. Uh, that's what we do. We have support groups within the communities with the children so that when they are out of our centers, they still have somewhere to go and they have some linkages within the communities. I think that's where community support, the linkages and those positive factors, uh, community, uh, you know, community uh, support is essential. And that's why that it would ensure uh, with whatever resources you have within the community, we must optimize on them we must know what those uh, support systems are, that are there and ensure that whoever is uh, connecting with us for treatment are able to uh, access those and, and they are available to them. Thank you very much, Bilal. So, uh, Ramiro, would you want to comment on that? 
Gracias, Martín. Sí, efectivamente, yo creo que tenemos que individualizar, coincido, tenemos que individualizar el tratamiento a la hora de hablar de duración y no limitarnos solamente a, a pasar de la abstinencia aguda este, y quedarnos con los 90 días. Hemos comentado en varias de las presentaciones que es importante que después de terminar un tratamiento de internamiento podamos continuar con servicios de consulta externa para poder realmente, no solamente alargar y, y prevenir la recaída, sino que, que nosotros realmente podamos incidir en, en, en el tema de, de, de la enfermedad, eh, reconociéndola como una enfermedad cerebral, y darle un tra el tratamiento más óptimo, sobre todo que el tratamiento tenga la duración necesaria para que pueda tener el impacto y la efectividad necesaria. Thank you very much, uh, Ramiro. Uh, so, the uh, participants who want to know uh, more about uh, uh, motivational uh, enhancement approach, uh, uh, there are questions here, maybe more or less, I will combine the, the questions. Uh, could you talk more to the way it is put here? Uh, I think. Annette can, can take this. Uh, participants want to know, are we saying that uh, 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 patients should not be forced into, into treatment? Uh, again, uh, uh, could you elaborate on strategies uh, staff can use to motivate uh, people into treatment? So uh, these are more or less uh, two questions in one. Uh, are we saying that treatment, uh, patients should not be forced into treatment? And the second one is how will um, uh, staff or service providers uh, motivate uh, patients to be part of this uh, uh, treatment? Thank you. Okay, I think again, I think there's two big questions there. Uh, one is, I think that one is about coerced uh, treatment or mandated treatment. Uh, that is used in many countries, in, including my own. Um, and then the second question is, how can we motivate people into uh, treatment? Um, I think I'll take the first one, the, the second one first, if I may, and I think other people may want to contribute to this. How can we motivate people into treatment? Um, I think that we need to make the treatment fit the patient rather than the treatment fit the people who are delivering it is one of the key things and i'm i'm a great believer in uh, co-designing treatment uh, with uh, the patients or clients to make it as uh, attractive to them and as accessible to them uh, as we can um, people face such huge stigma often in their lives if they have a drug use disorder problem and huge stigma in going to services that I really think that we have to make every effort to lower the barriers and um, and and meet people on their terms so you know if you've got a treatment service and it offers a certain approach that's not wanted by many of the service users or patients out there they won't go they won't go if we create too many hurdles in terms of getting to treatment in terms of accessibility where the treatment service is located if they're faced with banks of paperwork if they think their confidentiality is going to be breached all of these things will put people off and they will make them feel very very unsafe and not want treatment so i think it's down to us as professionals in order to make treatment as accessible as possible and uh, really understand the lives that the patients or people with drug use disorders are having and try and meet them on their terms. That, that's, uh, but I, the second one I think is a separate, separate question, but I'd be very interested in hearing the other, uh, other speakers' uh, views on that. 
Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, your, this explanation has more or less answered the two, the two uh, questions. Uh, let me take this up with uh, uh, Bilal. Uh, participants want to know the legal, the legal challenges uh, one can encounter in the course of providing uh, SUD treatment for children. So what are, what are your experiences like, especially legal, from legal point of view? What are the challenges? Uh, challenges uh, from uh, from which perspective? I am. I, I will be. I'm. I'm sorry. Uh, I need a bit more yes, clarity. No. When it comes to providing treatment uh, for for children, what are the yes. what are the challenges, especially from a legal perspective? Bearing in mind that uh, these are children, uh, juvenile laws, among others. Well, uh, let me. Uh, this juvenile center that I spoke of is the study that I have, the case study that I have shared, is the only center in Delhi. And uh, in fact, it is the one of its kind in India. So you don't have, you have juvenile homes in India, but you don't have juvenile homes for those who are into substance use and who are uh, into drug use in india so you have a lot of juvenile homes but you don't have any facility for those who are juveniles and are in, into substance use so and all the children who come to us are through the juvenile justice board they come through the court the magistrate would order them and come and they would come in our center so so it is only the select ones who are into substance use would come and access our service at our center uh, so it is actually it is by it's an order so you don't have option of saying no but then the child is in the custody of the state so it's it's uh, it's not just it's not something which has been told to him to be especially done it's something which is the which is the child is doing because he is in any way in the custody of the state so that is uh, in the context of juvenile in the context of children as such yes it's a, uh, it's a, you know, it's in the uh, legally you can't have a child in any residential setup. So for that, there is a, what we call child welfare committee. So we do have two centers for girls and boys, where we do have uh, kids coming from the streets, and they are coming through the child welfare committee. So child welfare committee would refer them to that center unless a child is presented to a child welfare committee. And unless a child comes through to us with through a child welfare committee, we can't have a child in our center because the child is a minor. So from that perspective, we can't treat a kid who is below 18 and is not coming through the child welfare committee. So, from, so that was one. Uh, have I made myself clear or you wanted to ask something else? Yes, yes, yes. I, I think that is very clear. That is very clear. You know, uh, another thing possibly Thank you may want to add is uh, how do you obtain cost, consent uh, from children? How do from you obtain parents. consent uh, from the parents? From the parents. From the parents. We get okay. consent okay. from the parents. Uh, yeah. Unless the parent consents or the guardian you know, or the caregiver or whoever is taking care of the kid a lot of and lot of kids come through the civil society organization the civil society organization acts as a guardian gives us a consent and that the kid comes to us okay thank you very much uh, ramiro would you like to comment on this si sí, martin gracias este efectivamente en atención a a, a las preguntas porque ya ya creo que queda poco tiempo Este, definitivamente eh, se pueden utilizar diferentes intervenciones como el caso de la entrevista motivacional para, para los pacientes para para ayudarlos precisamente a que a que se queden en tratamiento a lograr esta parte de, 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 de su adherencia terapéutica tenemos otras intervenciones como la terapia racional emotiva algunas otras que, que utilizamos generalmente aquí en méxico esto respondiendo a la motivación y con esto lograr una mejor adherencia terapéutica. Sin embargo, eh, y con relación precisamente a, a tu última pregunta respecto a los desafíos legales para poder brindar eh, tratamiento a niños, yo creo que aquí en México tenemos una limitante muy importante. Son pocos los establecimientos que tratan a niños precisamente eh, por todo, eh, no, no solamente por la parte de, de la individualización del tratamiento, sino sobre todo por esta situación legal que, que concurre, 
Sin embargo, eh, existe la experiencia en México de eh, tratamientos eh, para incluso eh, en donde se puede internar el niño y la mujer, eh, eh, la mamá en este sentido, perdón, eh, para, para que puedan acceder a tratamiento. Este, y yo creo que tendremos que trabajar mucho en este sentido porque la edad de inicio para el consumo de drogas cada vez ha venido disminuyendo de manera importante y, y, y volver a comentar esta parte de cuando un niño se inicia de manera temprana en el consumo de sustancias, eh, obligadamente por, al afectar el proceso de neuromaduración va a traer consigo un trastorno mental en su etapa de la vida adulta. Entonces es, es, es necesario incorporar eh, eh, en el tratamiento, el, el tratamiento como tal para, no sé, el trastorno por déficit de atención y hiperactividad, el trastorno posicionista desafiante y algunas otras eh, 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 situaciones que vemos durante la infancia precisamente y que nos van a ayudar precisamente a tener una mayor efectividad en el tratamiento y como ya lo comentaron los ponentes anteriores, eh, la parte del el, el trabajar mucho en la prevención comunitaria con, con, con énfasis en las intervenciones familiares, yo creo que eso va a tener un impacto muy importante para que logramos nosotros realmente incidir de, de manera efectiva en, 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 tanto en la prevención como en la parte de tratamiento. Thank you very much, Ramiro. Incidentally, this is the much uh, we can take. Uh, time is not always uh, uh, a friend. Uh, I, think, I still have some questions here, but we cannot uh, take more than what uh, we have now. And of course, the participants, some of them are wondering how uh, uh, we cope, especially uh, uh, treatment uh, as part of prevention, as part uh, directing the question to Bilal in particular. How do we cope when we don't have the support, the financial support or support from government? That, of course, will remain a challenge for a very long time. So uh, evidence-based, of course, yes. Uh, levels of evidence, we know that uh, through uh, evidence-based interventions, uh, uh, treatment and prevention uh, uh, cases works better. But at the same time, how do we get uh, policymakers? How do we get uh, government? Uh, uh, functionaries, how do we get even family support? How do we get the support of uh, different stakeholders to be able to support uh, evidence in translating uh, research evidence to, to practice? That has always been a challenge, and this is part of our take uh, away from this uh, session that we'll work together uh, to see how uh, uh, we can translate um, uh, evidence uh, to practice. And of course, that does not rule out uh, reviewing because uh, we cannot go without a form of adaptation uh, in different um, in different uh, countries, in different communities. Um, uh, uh, of course, reviewing uh, through uh, the peculiarities of different settings uh, to see that uh, uh, with time, you know, uh, some of these uh, interventions will be more or less uh, uh, domesticated, even in areas where they have not been able to uh, go through the highest level of, um, of, uh, of uh, evidence. And that is talking of uh, the meta analysis uh, and, and, and so on. So uh, one thing that we must not forget is that when it comes to treatment interventions, uh, the patient or the client is very important. And uh, the, the, the more we put them into consideration, working together from the therapy's point of view, evolving uh, evidence-based interventions, and also looking at their peculiarities, the better in delivering prevention and treatment uh, interventions in this area. So it is on this note, I once again thank uh, the great uh, speakers, uh, Annette, uh, Bilal, and uh, Ramiro. It is indeed a great pleasure moderating uh, uh, the, this uh, session. Uh, so uh, I saw, I want to say thank you, uh, Jeff, uh, Olivia, uh, Joanna, and others, we appreciate you for giving us uh, these opportunities. And to all the participants, thank you for being there. And thank you for your uh, wonderful uh, questions. Uh, before I end this session, let me also remind you that uh, we shall be starting uh, the third session uh, in about an hour from now. Please uh, stay tuned.
and uh, be part of that session again. It is on this note I say thank you everyone for being part of this and bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.